In this last module of chapter 3, we'll be looking at newborns and how they adapt to the world. One of the most important uh, components of adapting to life is considered to be uh, the intimacy and connection we form with others. And in children, we call it bonding. Uh, this close physical contact uh, stimulates the child in a way that allows them to release and secrete hormones that allow them to build connection with others. But it's not only for the child, it's also for the parents. Women who have children uh, often have higher levels of oxytocin, which is a hormone that causes bonding. And in addition to the bonding, it also uh, causes milk production in addition to other uh, hormones and allows the woman to increase responsiveness to a baby. The question with fathers, however, is that since they don't have higher oxytocin levels, um, well, one of the interesting things we find in them is that uh, they decrease their androgen, which is the testosterone and, and that which makes them manly, and then they increase uh, estrogen, which is what makes us a little bit more uh, in touch with our feminine side. And this is what allows us to create a better bond with others. Interesting to see how bond requires that we put the macho side uh, away. Um, and the question here is that if it happens with fathers and mothers, can it happen with adoptive parents? And we actually find that, uh, in fact, it is possible. Adoptive parents are just as uh, connected to their children, uh, and they also experience these hormonal uh, changes. Thanks to reflexes, we are able to survive right after we're born. As you may remember from other classes, uh, the way we used to eat in our womb, mother's womb was through the umbilical cord. How is it that minutes after we're born, we no longer eat through there, but know exactly how to eat through our mouth? Well, that is thanks to reflexes, which are basically automatic responses uh, so that we could survive. Now, some of the reflexes we'll be discussing have survival values, such as sucking and swimming and clearing the throat to avoid choking on things, but some of them do not, as we'll discuss in a few. Uh, the majority of these reflexes begin to are present in the first uh, months of our lives, but they begin to disappear uh, after we begin to develop cognitively. Our cognition is uh, made possible thanks to the development of our cerebral cortex, which is a uh, considered to be the new part of our brain uh, in terms of evolution. Now, because of the growth in this in here, we also have a gradual increase in voluntary behavior. So the presence of voluntary behavior uh, basically removes the reflexes, which were automatic. Um, some disappear early in life, but will reappear later, uh, such as swimming, palmer grasp, and stepping for some of us. Uh, and we'll see in the next slide how some of them have no value apparently, but uh, they may in the long run. Here you can see some of the other reflexes. Uh, you could see that, uh, for example, um, uh, the palmer grasp, which is when a child uh, grasps and grabs the finger that would have been put there. Um, this is believed to help the individual just to voluntarily grasp things, and so some people see that there's no um, survival value for it. However, um, the argument is that if the individual is not able to sense um, in his hand different things, then it may be difficult for the child to adjust to the world. As you may remember from Piaget's theory, uh, the first stage is based on senses, sensory motor stage. So our ability to step and to do things is essential. So you could take a look at the reflexes here and uh, see which ones seem to have survival value and which ones do not. All of them, however, please note, are essential for a uh, healthy upbringing. For newborns, for infants, which are again ages of 0 to 12 months of age, there are uh, different states of arousal, and that is uh, the degree to which you and I are asleep or awake. And we find that there are five different states throughout the day and night. We have regular, or also known as NREM or non-REM, uh, and that basically is the opposite of REM sleep, which stands for rapid eye movement. Once again, REM stands for rapid eye movement. And you'll see that 
um, the regular and irregular sleep uh, is divided evenly, about 50% uh, for each. As we get older, we begin to decline uh, the number of time, the amount of time we spend in REM sleep. And by the time we get to adulthood, um, uh, in fact, by the time we get to three to five years old, we're already at adult level percentage, which is 20% uh, of REM once we get to this age. In order for us to grow, um, we need to spend a significant amount of time sleeping. That's where we secrete um, the growth hormone, GH. Uh, the drowsiness will vary from child to child, and the alertness and quiet, well awake, but, but quiet, typically is between two to three hours. Uh, the waking activity and crying is making up about one to four hours. But please note that newborns must sleep a significant amount of time. You could see in here that they sleep from 16 to 18 hours per day. Uh, the majority of them sleep more at night, but it has a lot to do with whether, with whether mother was a, uh, also a, a night person and be asleep through the night, or if she went to bed late, it is uh, more likely that the child would also uh, be awake at night. Crying is one of the most complex stimuli that we see in a baby, and uh, it is normal for them to cry. Uh, that's their only way of communicating to us. Uh, all babies will have these fuzzy periods uh, in which they will not be the most pleasant to have around. Uh, the primary cause of crying for them is uh, hunger. Um, this typically decreases in early weeks, and it peaks uh, around week six uh, to decline thereafter. But there is also abnormal crying, which is uh, seen commonly among babies who have brain damage, and their crying tends to be short in duration, but very, very loud and, and, and piercing. There's also colic with uh, individuals who have persistent crying, and it is longer uh, crying than uh, the one described previously, but high-pitched and harsh sounding as well. Uh, this is often, sadly, a cause uh, for abuse by highly stressed parents. So if the parents are not resting well and they don't have the social support that uh, they should have, uh, they often lose their temper with the child and they uh, may not realize that they're crying not because they're being bad but because of maybe a condition or an ill or because their brain is not developed well. When it comes down to adapting to the world, touch is essential. Uh, touch allows an individual to uh, understand what's hot and what to touch and what not, but uh, it also helps us stimulate physical growth. Um, we find that by being caressed, as uh, the kids who do not have access to an isolate, um, their parents caressing their body allows them to grow faster. And we find that the most responsive areas in an infant are the mouth, the cheeks, the palm, the sole, the feet, and, and the genitals. They seem to respond more so to those areas than other parts. We also find that uh, infants are sensitive to pain, uh, but uh, the pain also helps us adapt to the world uh, so that we can understand what to touch and what to stay away from. One of the things that we can uh, reduce, that it used to reduce the pain that's associated with stress is a mother's milk. And mother's milk, um, there's nothing that comes close to it to be able to provide the nutrients and the benefits of of uh, the mother's breast milk. The taste buds uh, are uh, often present in us since we are uh, born, but uh, newborns for the most part respond very positively to uh, sweet tastes. Uh, and in fact, a mother's uh, milk is often uh, the best type of tasting food for, for children, uh, as newborns uh, are capable of distinguishing several basic tastes uh, at the beginning of their life, they prefer sweet stuff, but as they get to four months, they may prefer salty and plain water over uh, milk. Uh, this uh, preference for salty and plain taste uh, is believed to be associated with uh, preparation for future uh, food intake that will bring about more different taste qualities. The smell, which is strongly associated with taste, uh, is also associated with uh, mother's exposure to different food and odors while she was pregnant. Uh, we find that uh, children, for the most part, respond well to banana and chocolate smell, um, but they may not respond well to uh, things like ginger, uh, unless the mother was exposed to ginger uh, when she was pregnant. Uh, 
Um, in a study that was done in 2001, there's something interesting uh, in how children prefer the smell of natural body odor of the mother than that which was washed. Uh, within an hour after birth, they washed one breast with soap to remove the natural scent, and they left the other with uh, as natural as it could be. And uh, children would often prefer an unwashed breast uh, when they were put in front of it. They would uh, suck or be close to it or as if they were uh, put in the breast that had been washed and stripped of the natural scent. They would sometimes not uh, want to suck the breast or uh, would not be uh, comfortable there. Hearing is another capacity that allows us to adapt to the world and we find that uh, newborns can hear a variety of sounds. Uh, about three days, they are believed to be capable of turning in the direction where sound may be coming from. Uh, also on the third day, they recognize a mother's voice. This is interesting because uh, we find that uh, in common culture, people believe that a child is born uh, already identifying a mother's voice. But if you've ever heard your own voicemails, you know that you don't sound the same as you think you sound. Uh, and that is because sound travels uh, airborne, but when we say it, it also travels uh, through our bone and through our flesh, therefore changing the sound of our voice. So when a child is exposed to his mother's voice for months while in the womb, it is important to note that it is going to be a different sound when it is only coming from the outside and not through flesh. Uh, we find that sensitivity uh, to hearing improves greatly over the first six months, and it will show g gains and improvement also through preschool years. Uh, surprisingly, uh, in some way, uh, children are responsive to those cartoon voices, which are happy, high-pitched voices. Uh, children tend to respond better to women's voices, which tend to be higher pitched than to a very deep voice of a male. Uh, additionally, they uh, often respond better uh, to paused speech rather than continuous. Uh, so my type of speech pattern for a child would not be very attractive because it's a continuous uh, rather than paused, which would allow them to process uh, word for word or phrase by phrase. Vision is the sensory capacity that is the least developed when we are born. Uh, this is in part due to the fact that the retinal cells uh, are not uh, packed yet. Uh, as we get older, uh, our retinal cells, which are made up of rods and cones and, and different other cells, uh, they uh, allow us to be able to uh, view and perceive things in a clear fashion. Um, the transduction, which is uh, basically the translation from light to neural impulses, which is the language of the brain, um, are not, is not possible earlier in life because uh, the retinal cells are not ready yet. Uh, additionally, the lens, which sits right behind the, uh, the pupil and, and the iris, is responsible for focus and adjustment so we could see things clearly. But uh, this lens is flexed, uh, bent, excuse me, based on the flexing of muscles. Uh, but since the muscles are weak, then we cannot see things clearly. For the most part, newborn babies see images that are closed uh, in a blurry fashion. Uh, and newborns tend to be responsive to uh, human faces, uh, large heads, oversized facial features, and, and color stimuli, which may explain why the cartoon characters tend to have big eyes and big heads. Uh, and that is so that they can make them more appealing and attractive to children. It's been said that not uh, that siblings are not born to the same family. Uh, and that is to say that although they may be born to the same mo mother and father, uh, they will be different from each other in different ways. And, and that is due to genetic reasons and also um, the type of parenting that we may get. The reaction range, which is basically a person's unique genetically determined response to the environment, could set us apart to things. For example, what a child and a sibling may perceive as exciting, another may perceive as boring, and that could be uh, due to genetic um, reasons. 
We also find that a genetic and environmental correlation exists when our genes influence the type of environment that we may be exposed to. So in a passive correlation, we find that athletic parents may expose a child to athletic activities. And this in part may result in the child being uh, a good athlete due to both the genetic predisposition and the environmental exposure that the parents put them through. Uh, an um, evocative uh, correlation, on the other hand, is an active social baby that is more likely to receive more social stimulation. And that is, for example, a child likely to become a good athlete due to uh, genetic and environmental reasons. Uh, so this is basically evoked based on the experience that the child is receiving, not necessarily because of genes uh, alone. All in all, we find that in both passive and evocative correlations, you have an interaction between the genetic and environmental factors. Niche picking, which is uh, the relationship between our environment, is basically choosing environments that complement our heredity. So if a child is muscular by nature, then they're likely to pick activities that would allow them to excel in sports. If a child is uh, likely to excel in uh, a lot of artistic skills, then they're more likely to pick drawing or things that are better for them. When it comes down to our genetic predisposition, we find that if uh, an opt in children are growing up in another environment, their genes are still part of them uh, and they play a role in who they become. Uh, adopted children and adolescents, they uh, often have a lot of learning and, and emotional difficulties um, to overcome than non-adopted children. And what we find is that as the child's age at the time of adoption increases, the more difficult it can be for some of these adoptees to, to overcome these. When it comes to intelligence and personality differences, however, um, we find that uh, the adoptive parents may often feel that the child's uh, inherited uh, traits may threaten the family stability. Uh, in order for a parent to be a good adopted parent, they need to understand that the child will come with their own uh, nature, with their own genes, and the parent must be there to support and guide and modify whatever needs to be modified, but there should be no difference or fear in terms of what the child uh, ought to be. Um, in among adopted kids, we find that uh, their curiosity about who their parents are typically emerges around adolescence. Um, and despite this curiosity and, and turmoil, uh, we find that most adoptees appear to be well-adjusted as adults and sometimes even better than those who are not adopted.